Hello, my name is Anna Forsman and I am research faculty at the University of Central Florida here in Orlando. And I'm super excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about the work that we are doing in my lab here to understand uh, the foraging ecology of Purple Martin, so specifically trying to characterize the diet composition of these birds. So thank you so much to the PMCA for inviting me to be here today and also to all of you guys who are tuning in. So I'm actually going to start off with my acknowledgments. I want to introduce you to my lab here at UCF, the Wild Symbiosis Lab. So I lead up this group of very enthusiastic students, mostly undergraduate students at UCF, um, but I also have one incoming master's student, Stephanie Gaspar, who you'll be hearing from later in this conference about some of the work that she's doing through her graduate work. So together with my students, we established the UCF Purple Martin Project in 2020. In uh, January, February of 2020, we set up actually at that time 12 houses. We have 14 now with a total of 162 gourds for these birds. And uh, we set, set these houses up and left for spring break, hopefully hoping that we would have some birds when we returned. And in fact, that was the case. The Martins found us while we were on spring break, but so did COVID. And so the students unfortunately didn't end up coming back after spring break. So the 2020 field season was very limited and disorganized to say the least. However, we still were able to uh, attract 12 nesting pairs and ended up with a total of 50 fledglings, which we thought was very exciting. We weren't sure whether we were going to be able to get any birds at all. So we thought it was a great start to the UCF Purple Martin project. And thanks to the PMCA, we feel like we were really launched into the Purple Martin world also. And the, the PMCA was, very, very important to to getting this project off of the, the ground. Um, we received lots of great advice and expertise that allowed us to to get everything started. So despite our rocky start there in 2020, uh, 2021 was a lot better. Uh, we ended up uh, being able to ban 70 adults and 175 chicks. So we the numbers of nesting pairs definitely increased and we had our first field season so we were actually able to start some of the research projects that uh, we wanted to conduct uh, at UCF. And then in 2022, we had another really productive season. We banded over 300 birds. We had over 50 nesting pairs. And so we feel like we're well on our way now, um, uh, despite uh, COVID uh, uh, making making for a little bit of an interesting start to everything. So uh, the students in my lab are interested in lots of different things. Uh, for myself, I'm primarily interested in understanding how the birds interact with microorganisms in the environment. Um, but my students uh, are interested in lots of different aspects of purple martin biology. And so these are just a couple of the different types of research um, directions that we work on in my lab. But today I'm going to focus on on talking about foraging ecology. And so one of the things that happens in my lab and in the field work that we do is that we end up collecting a lot of fecal samples. Uh, they are very easy to collect. The birds are very cooperative, especially the nestlings in, in providing us with those fecal samples. And what's so great about these fecal samples is that they contain lots and lots of information um, that we can use to understand uh, what the birds are eating or what their gut microbiomes look like, what parasites they're exposed to. And so my lab uh, has gotten a little bit of a reputation for being the poop lab in the department. Uh, so we do in fact study poop for lots of different reasons. <clears throat> so let me explain. I realize this is not a purple martin, but for illustrative purposes, hopefully this will do. And so when we characterize the diet of purple martins, what we're interested in is reconstructing that mixture of insects or identifying that mixture of insects that the bird is consuming that ends up going through the digestive system and comes out on the other side as a fecal sample. Well, these fecal samples co uh, contain lots of DNA. Of course, they that contain um, DNA from the host or the bird itself, so in this case a chicken, um, but it, the fecal sample also collect, 
can, um, contains lots of DNA from those insects or any other organisms that's, that have been consumed. And so we take advantage of that DNA, we extract that insect DNA, sequence that DNA to figure out what those insects are. So I just want to insert an aside here that in addition to the host DNA into the food DNA, there's also lots of DNA from the gut microbiome, so bacteria and parasites. So there are lots of other things that we can look for using fecal forensics. So stay tuned to Stephanie Gaspar's uh, uh, talk later in the conference and you'll learn more about bacteria. So the technique that we use to um, to identify these insects is called DNA metabarcoding. So when I teach genomics at UCF, I like to use the analogy of going to the grocery store and shopping for macaroni and cheese. And so if you bring up a bunch of these boxes of macaroni and cheese to the cashier, the cashier is going to scan the barcode and um, each brand of macaroni and cheese is going to have its own unique serial number, which will be compared against a reference database. And so even without looking at the, the brand of the macaroni and cheese, the cashier is going to know right away what it is because they've scanned that barcode and the barcode matches to that reference database. So the ultimate goal here is to figure out the um, taxonomic classification or the species, if you will, of, of um, macaroni and cheese. So this is exactly what we're doing with uh, when we're trying to characterize the diet. And so we're extracting insect DNA from the fecal samples, and then we're scanning um, in a barcode, of, so just a small portion of the genome and sequencing that on a DNA sequencer and comparing that DNA sequence against a known reference library that contains known insects that have been sequenced previously so we can figure out, um, we can come up with a list of insects that the birds have eaten. So to do this with the Purple Martins, I got together with a, a great group of Purple Martin biologists, of course, Joe Segris with the PMCA, so he collected samples for us from Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, Kevin Frazier collected samples for us uh, from Manitoba, from Winnipeg and Manitoba, and then uh, Jason Fisher collected samples for us uh, from Orlando. And then those samples were all sent to us. There were about 150 samples uh, in total. They were sent to us at UCF. So uh, Stephanie and I worked on those in the lab, extracting DNA and doing the DNA sequencing. And then uh, Brandon, Brandon Honig is the um, person who's helped us then with matching up those um, DNA sequences to the reference database to figure out what insects were actually being consumed by these birds. So this is what uh, our lab setup looks like at UCF. Uh, and so this is where we're taking those fecal samples, mixing them up to homogenize them and uh, extracting that insect DNA. So once the samples have been sequenced or the DNA samples have been sequenced and we figured out what those bugs are, um, we discovered that we could identify 71 different insect species across the three different sites. And those species came from 29 different families and 10 orders. So in this figure here, I'm showing you those 10 orders uh, and the frequency or occurrence or how abundant those different orders were in the diets of birds from the three different sites. So on the left hand side, you can see the scientific names of those orders starting there with Coleoptera going through Diptera and down. And then on the right hand side, I've written the common names uh, for those of you like myself, who are not used to thinking about the scientific names of, of uh, arthropods. You can see them here on the right hand side. So we see right away uh, that the, the most common taxa or the most common types of arthropods detected uh, in these birds were the diptera or the flies, uh, the lepidoptera, which are the butterflies and moths, and the odonata, which are the dragonflies and damselflies, which is not surprising to those of you who are Purple Martin landlords, you're well familiar with um, their fondness uh, for dragonflies. And so what I'm showing you here in this figure is um, uh, this frequency of occurrence or how 
um, how commonly the different types of arthropods are being consumed by purple martins at a certain site. So just for an example, we can see here that in Winnipeg, for example, almost every single one of the uh, fecal samples that we tested, uh, we could detect diptera or, or the flies. Okay, so now that we know that information, we can look across the three different sites to, to start looking at some differences in some seeming preferences of these birds that differ across the sites. So for example, we can see here that the, the group Coleoptera, so the, the beetles, um, over 50% of the fecal samples in, from Erie, in fact, Ha, uh, we could detect these coleopterans, whereas um, in uh, Orlando and Winnipeg, the frequency of occurrence was much, much lower. So it seems like they were not, the birds were not eating as many of those coleopterans at those um, sites. But then if we look at some of the other groups like the Hymenoptera, which are the bees, ants, and wasps, and the Orthoptera and Trichoptera, uh, we actually didn't detect any of those in the Erie samples, whereas we did in Orlando, in Winnipeg, uh, at differing um, at differing levels. For example, in Orlando, we saw um, almost uh, so about 40 45 percent of the samples contain DNA traces from Hymenoptera so again those are those bees ants and wasps whereas we picked it up in Winnipeg but at a much lower um, uh, frequency of occurrence and then those Ixodida the <laughs> the ticks uh, the only site we picked those up were in Orlando, was in Orlando. We did not see that at any of the other sites. And so it may have been that the birds were actually going out and eating these um, ticks, or it could simply be that they were being um, picked off of the birds and then consumed. Right, so um, we do in fact see from these data some differences uh, across the sites, which was one of the things that we were really interested in, in starting to look at. But the other thing that we really wanted to do with these data uh, was to figure out the best method for um, using DNA metabarcoding to, um, to characterize diet. And so we actually picked two different barcodes to look at. And so that's what this information is at the bottom of the screen. Um, ANML is one type of barcode and ZBJ is another type of barcode. And so what we found when we compared those two barcodes to each other is that they do in fact differ in, in um, their performance for um, classifying, so for detecting and classifying yeah, insects. And so we found that over 50% uh, of the detections that we made could in fact be classified down to the species level for using the ANML uh, barcode, whereas using the ZBJ barcode, only a third of the detections could be identified to species. And of course, we want to not just be able to detect these insects, but we want to be able to say what they are. So from the study, um, we have determined that going forward in all of our studies, uh, using metabarcoding to characterize diet, we're going to stick with the ANML primer pair and so, uh, or that, that barcode. So we're really excited to have um, those results. Those are also really important um, results, not just for guiding our research of Purple Martins, but also for guiding uh, uh, foraging ecology research of other insectivorous species, which is of course important because we know that both insectivorous birds and insect populations are decreasing globally. So having a non-invasive way of being able to characterize um, insect, uh, um, uh, insect occurrences and insect um, consumption across different sites is super, super important and has lots of conservation implications. So I am almost out of time here, so I'm going to just uh, end my presentation by showing some pictures of uh, the particular species or some of the particular species that we picked up with this study. I'll say that I did not take these pictures. I only see the DNA sequences. I don't actually see the, um, the bugs unless I'm out in the field. And as uh, many of us are and see the remnants of the bugs left inside, <laughs> inside the gourds or on the porches. So lots of beautiful dragonflies, crane flies, uh, caddisflies, damselflies, um, beetles, ants, 
uh, of lots of different types here. So uh, with that, I will stop, take any questions, and also let you know that if uh, you're interested in reading more, check out the spring issue of the Popo Martin update, uh, and you can read more of the, about this particular study. Thank you so much, the PMCA. Thank you to all of you, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks.